What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of All Access Magic. This is going to be everybody's favorite episode. This is the Blaze episode. This is where we're taking over. We've we've taken over the show, Team Blaze, everybody that's been in the comments. I know that we've got a little bit of Team Edward, Team Jacob going on, Team Ryan, Team Blaze. Team Blaze is in these streets tonight. Um, uh, but in in all seriousness, uh, we'd like to send out our thoughts and our prayers to Ryan and his family. There's been a death in his family. When our, our condolences out to Ryan, who unfortunately is not able to make it tonight. Now, on my end, this is now we get into where Blaze may or may not have dropped the ball, is I was under the impression that Ryan told X that he needed him to fill in today, and that may or may not have gotten to X. I think the message was not relayed, and I don't know if that was my fault of not telling X or that Ryan just forgot to tell him. It was probably my fault, and I misread a text. Either way, Xavier is not expecting to come on, which is perfect, and it brought me to thinking about something that happened during the uh, during the pandemic is the the fact that a lot of online communities formed and this is what became the magic community during during the pandemic and there are a lot of magicians who actually became magicians during the the post covid era and their introduction to the magic community prior to magic conventions or anything was discord and that was their way of joining the magic community and that made me think let me hop on ye old discord and let me find the coolest person i can find and also someone who was a bit of a liaison for the magic community during the beginning of that dark era i'd like to bring on an incredibly creative man an incredible performer a great script writer uh, a mentor to many magicians the one and only perseus the man the myth the legend archimanes welcome to the show thanks for having me how are you doing thanks man? for coming on i'm good dude i was scrambling a little bit to be honest <laughs> it was literally for everybody who saw um we did an episode um that was the magic live special of all access magic so it was all access magic live and what we did is rather than booking guests with time slots uh ryan and i we found one place that we could record at magic live and then each of us one of us would stay there and the other person would take their phone and would record them running through the uh running through the whole casino trying to find a guest and then grab them bring them back and see who could get who could in the fastest time get the coolest person <laughs> and this is exactly what just happened but yeah. instead of instead of running through the, the hallways of magic live i was running through the streets of discord and uh and found yeah. perseus who was uh chilling and jamming and was gracious enough to, to come over here so thank you for joining us on the show man thanks for we wanted me. to have you for a really long time now talking about discord before um that's something that you uh still spend quite a bit of time on now oh, but i feel like probably near the beginning of the pandemic you were spending a ton of time on and uh and were, were really i think impactful to the magic community and got a lot of people to meet each other during that time so what was it like um adapting to ma the magic virtual space at the beginning of the pandemic and then getting into discord uh, i i was into discord i mean ages ago because mm -hmm. i like to play games and all that so Same, like yeah. i'm the, you know you do a bunch of servers where you get well playing yeah so uh when the pandemic hit i mean when it comes to virtual shows and all that never got into the game i was like nope <laughs> to me magic is is and always be a live art and I, I i mean you can put on the best show and in a Zoom or in, on Discord, but I don't think it can have the same impact that it could have live. So I was like, I'm not gonna bother. I'm gonna do something else. Mm, yeah, that was the the time where we started. Me and my friend JT started working for E, and yeah. basically that's how we began. We we're like, you know, guys, so you and uh, JT were yeah. friends in Greece prior yeah, yeah. to working together. Okay. Yeah, we have both released stuff with Illusionist in the past. Mm. And at some point when the pandemic hit, uh, and after that, uh, all of that, that I, I don't want to call it, I, I would call it the one of the worst marketing uh, happenings in magic, the thing with mm. back in black and all that, that it wasn't totally their fault, but that's a different story. So yeah, when they this had, hit, they had an interesting marketing strategy at the time. It and, went south, you know, yeah. getting a lot of hate, and we're like, yeah. you know what, we should 
probably tell them, you know, what we believed was their mistake. And we basically send him a, an email, you know, we think that your mistake is that, you know, you've put yourselves in a pedestal, you've served the, the connection with your fan base and all that. And we have wow. a few ideas that you can use to, uh, you know, bring them back. And that's when we, we proposed, you know, Twitch streaming, a uh, Discord server that would act as a forum and a jamming uh, place uh as well as you know youtube videos you know with tips and tricks about magicians and all that yeah. and surprisingly enough i said yeah let's do this and we're like all right let's do this and we did. wow well this is very early for one of these but i think i should drop that as a gold nugget for everybody if you are interested in trying to get a job somewhere in a particular community or niche or if there's a company that you really like the products of and you're not exactly happy with the direction the company's moving and you think you could do it better, don't just complain about it. You could actually make a difference and it led yeah. to a job. That's amazing that you and JT were outspoken. That's, and yeah, that's exactly I know exactly I right. know there were many of us who saw the marketing direction at the time of that company and were not fans of it and talked with each other and maybe gossiped about it, but didn't do anything to actually help or make a difference or maybe offer feedback about what the, the community was looking for, you know? And so the fact that you were like, Oh, well, here are some ideas here. Aren't just some issues we see here are some yeah. ideas for how we would change it. And by offering your suggestions, it led to like an opportunity. That's pretty. It did. Awesome. It did. And then kudos for them. You know, they gave us an opportunity. They hired us both. And we know we were doing much, more than that because we were also helping with the choice of you know we're bringing in artists we were just you know helping with the effects that artists sent us and all that uh we had a lot of creative freedom in, in illusionist and you know kudos to them uh for that and basically the, the, one of the things that we actually did was we made this e, the illusion server and uh, mm. that we jammed every day all day um and I, I won't I won't lie, man. I mean, I have made actual strong friendships from there. Yeah. I mean, we there's a, there's a whole group of us. Uh, obviously, we've moved on to another server, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 there's a whole group of us that, that we we jam every day. We talk about theory, talk about ideas. We help each other with you know upcoming gigs and all that. We actually just went on and made a meeting in Paris. I mean, and it's crazy. Think, yeah, the thing is, just you know, just wait. People, did that already happen? Yeah, we're oh, we're doing geez, one in Vienna now. I'm doing one in Vienna. I was like, yeah, we, we, it's Paris. like it's like Jeez. we're gonna we're gonna do that every every year because you know we, we love each other. It's like it's actual friendships. It's not like you know, neither magic friendships or yeah. online friendships, which are like kind of mm -hmm. friendship. It's, yeah. it's these are actual friends. I consider them friends of mine. And you know, absolutely, yeah. It 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 is. I mean. Uh, Although, however horrible COVID is and COVID, the COVID era was, I feel a little bit grateful for that, mm -hmm. you know, because without that, without this pandemic happening, I would not have had that. I would not have had this, uh, this shift in my career, you know, working for E, then, you know, opening my, launching my own Your company. Your own company, Orion, which yeah. I want to get to as well. But before yeah, we get yeah, onto sure. that, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you're absolutely right that it's, it was really amazing what this whole time, you know, did with connecting people from all around the world that had never met each other before. And, uh, and it was so fun this time going to magic live. I wish that you were able to make it uh, there this time because it was next so time. cool. Go uh, next time. Cause it was so fun going to magic live this time or Blackpool previously. And there were so many people that I got to meet for the first time that were from mm. discord, but it was so crazy because, you know that feeling that you have with an old friend where you just pick up right where you yeah, left off? Absolutely. That's how it felt, but it was with people that I was meeting for the first Same. time. Um, and it's, it's crazy because like at the beginning of the pandemic, like very, very early on, um, I already, I had made a magic discord that I invited like barely anybody to a few years ago. And then it didn't really kick off like, you know, a few years prior to the pandemic. And then it didn't really kick off cause I wasn't using it cause I could see people in person <laughs> and then everything yeah. locked down. And, um, Mike Martinez and I made this magic discord and then we did this whole magic tournament, which did really well. And it was like amazing to see it, to meet hundreds of magicians around and see all of the other magic discords that all popped off and these all individual communities was so exciting. And what was crazy is that Mike and I started that magic community, which now has like 
700 members or whatever has been a lot less active recently because we don't really use discord as much but he and i when we started it had never met each other we only met each other for the first time like two weeks ago at magic live <laughs> in person <laughs> you know we only knew each other in line and now because of that community now we know all of these new people online absolutely it's crazy yeah and then what what you did with the illusionist discord um especially having the reach of a company you were able to be, become one of the biggest online magic communities like so quickly it was crazy and, and the thing is i, I think that one of the reasons obviously it was the reach of illusion is but one of the reasons that this happened is because we really cared mm -hmm. i mean yeah. it wasn't the job i was there 24 7 i was jamming with everybody yeah. i was you know giving any tips or advice i may have i was listening to a lot i mean i, I enjoyed doing that I, that's why i'm still doing it I'm on Discord yeah. every day. I mean, yeah, I'm, I love jamming and love talking about magic, you know, analyzing and that, you know, to what makes it work and how can we improve it. And it's like, it's, and I think people caught up to that, you know, they're mm -hmm. like, you know, it's not a company. It did, it was under the umbrella of illusionist, but it was basically, you know, our passion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it, and it, that was very apparent, especially like later on. I think it's really tough for people to understand the return on investment with time with a Discord server and how it, what it takes to actually build a real community. Because it's like you might think that you've built something really solid that's very active, but then the moment you as the key ingredient are less active this thing isn't just a well well-oiled machine yeah. that keeps moving without you which is so crazy is like um with my server when i felt like it was at its peak of activity and so many people and i was like well i could take a step back from this it's so active then yeah. you stop you stop spending 10 hours a day on the server and now it immediately falls off so quickly and i, I remember the same thing with the illusionist server where yeah. you and jt were really the heartbeat of that thing where it was also tied into a company so you were giving real-time customer support and feedback in a way that Absolutely. customers would never have that relationship with any kind of company but also they were building real friendships and yeah. you were moderating an online community of people trying to like you know meet and make friends and you had to be there so much like so many hours to keep i active. i got <clears throat> a lot of the times you know they told us you know you don't have to be there that much mm -hmm. and we're like we do you don't get it we do yeah. Yeah, because you know we a we want to and b it's needed. Yeah, you cannot you know it's like now it's it's a different thing now. I mean in the other server that I'm in, you know it's it's not under any umbrella of any company, not not mine either. So it's like it just you know it's just a, a bar in the side of the road that you check over the window if someone's in, someone might be in, you yeah. hop in, each other jamming. Someone yeah. not may not be in, you hop in and you just you know it's a completely yeah. different thing, but. When it is under the umbrella of a company, you need to be present. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much pressure because it's like you have to show that this thing is worth all of the time you're putting into it, right? Like, especially if that's a yeah. new concept you're bringing to a company to be like, oh, we're going to, we should do yeah. this Discord thing. Please, I, I promise you. I mean, I, I know it might sound uh, arrogant, but. Hmm. Whenever I had a clear vision in my head that something would work like this, mm. it always did. It always did, yeah. As long as I believe, I if I, in my head mm. at least, I analyzed it enough and believed in it, like, you know, mm. it's, like, it's like magic. You know, when you f I first, you know, turned pro, it was like, you know, people, especially here in Greece, were like, you know, no one can live out of magic. I'm like, I, I will. Mm. Because if you present it with passion, if you take care of it, people love magic. There's no such thing as people hating magic. People hate magic because they ha already had a, a shitty experience with it. I don't know if I can swear yeah. on it here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can. You can. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. No. Right. Uh, no holds barred. Absolutely. And you right. can be as honest as as you want to. And, Absolutely. You know. And so I. That's the thing. You know. If you you think it over, I mean, <clears throat> and you know, a Discord server, a Discord community. You know, if you're there and you're jamming and you're having fun and you're being honest and you're being authentic, mm. why wouldn't it work? Yeah, people are doing nothing. They're in their house all day. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. In my, in my mind, I didn't have any pressure if it didn't work or sh mm. show the upper echelons that it's working or whatever. Mm. It's like you know, I, I really you just like knew it. it would. Yeah, yeah, and I really, I really enjoyed it. And really, I still do. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And then now things have transitioned where your efforts and your time that are put into Discord are not necessarily for that company, but now also you're able to pave the way with building your your own company. And oh, do you absolutely. feel like a lot of the connections that you've made through through the online communities have helped you with with deciding to pursue that, still event, do. that venture? Still do. I I call them uh, <laughs> what's the word? My Senate. You said it. <laughs> yeah, because they're yeah. actual friends. You know, every time, every day, I, I'll probably go in and say, "Hey, guys, I, I have this thought about the company. Mm. What would you do if I said this?" Mm. And I go like, "Oh, fuck no, don't do this." I'm like, all right, no, it is nice. Bad idea. All right, bad no, idea. Bad idea. Yeah, bad idea. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll come with something. Or they just hop in and throw ideas, and you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing to have that, and the, it's like it's. In the end, if this company goes well enough in time, because it's going mm -hmm. well, but you never know how it's going to go in the future. Yeah. But if it's go well in time and all that, and people are going to be like, oh, he is, you know, self-created, you know, and that would be a damn lie. Mm -hmm. I, I owe so much to people mm -hmm. around me. And, and there you go. You can put that golden nugget uh, graphic on. <laughs> yeah. Because we think in magic that we can do everything on our own. Mm. There's this misconception, this you know, this myth that you can that it's it is a lonely a lonely road, mm. you know, and it that can be farther than the truth. We need other people. We need friends. We need people we trust to, you know, fresh eyes, fresh ideas, another perspective. That's yeah. the only way to grow. And also, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you need other people with expertises, you know, people go yeah. like, I, I'm going to build my own show and go, like, okay, get a director. I can direct my own show. Yeah. But a director would do it better because he's mm -hmm. a damn director. Because he's a director. So exactly. On. Yeah. That, I was on um, an app that I can't believe still exists, uh, Clubhouse, re uh, earlier today. I was, uh, I got a notification for it and I was, what? There's a magician room right now in Clubhouse? So I jump on and a bunch of uh, magicians from the UK are in there and they were talking about, um, they were talking about all different things like coming from a theater background and applying it to magic scripting. And one guy, Andrew, he was saying, you know, it's kind of admirable that for magicians that, you know, when you, when you talk to a magician, usually if, if they're a, you know, a performer or whatever, they are the director, writer, producer, performer yeah. in their show. And I was, they said that. And I was like, yeah, on one hand, it's an admirable thing. Like, yes, I, I've totally done that where I'm in that position well, of doing all of those roles. But at the same time, how well do you fill all of those roles? There's no way that you are as good at so being a writer as you are at a as being a performer or director or da 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 da, especially when you aren't in the. Do you, you don't have the opportunity to look at yourself with external eyes as a director, like you're within yeah. your own body. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's true that like we tend to take on all those roles, but it's so important to get the feedback of other people and appreciate their expertise and their knowledge. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's there's no, but that's the thing. There's this misconception that, you know, it's, it is, it's considered, you know, weakness to ask for help, to ask for mm. guidance, to ask for, you know, I how, do you got any idea? I have no clue how to do this. Mm. They, you know, people are feeling ashamed of saying that or expressing that to their peers, basically, you know, because because we're all magicians, so we are competing with each other of some, some sorts, mm. you know. So they how can I show them that I'm the most successful one if I tell them I have no clue how to do this? So I should have known. I should know. There, there's mm. shitty things like that that we need to get over. Yeah, somewhere. just getting People the ego, grow. like getting over the ego. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, having the humility to ask for help. Yeah. So, what was the magic community like in Greece when you were deciding to pursue performing? Because it seems like <laughs> it seems like there isn't much of one. I mean, you knew JT um, at some point along the way, but that's uh, way later. That's way later. Yeah, because yeah. you meant you mentioned earlier about what it was like to make the decision to say, you know, I believe in this, I'm going to pursue magic as a career. What yeah. was that like, you know, especially growing up in Greece? I think people aren't necessarily familiar with that. Uh, magic, well, I mean, historically speaking, magic was prevalent in Greece, not prevalent, like was part of Greece's culture in the ancient years. There were magicians, mm. there were jugglers, there were things like that. Mm. Later on, we just completely obliterated that there were none. 
Really? So, yeah. yeah, not even, you know, in the modern history. So when someone is in Greece uh, 20 years ago, when I started, said, you know, I want to be a magician, he was basically either doing kids' parties and doing balloons and stuff, um, or being a fakir at a circus. Mm. That was magic. So, mm, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I started learning magic through books and uh, videos and all that. And at some point, I was like, you know, I should try and do some. I mean, I think I can live with close up magic. Mm. And the, the then, you know, community of magicians were like, nah, we don't do that here. Really? <laughs> like, it, it's, yeah. it's uncommon to be able to survive doing close up magic as a career over there? There wasn't. There the, wasn't. Wow. Nobody did close of magic when I started doing close of magic in Greece. Wow. And so, yeah, I said, yeah, but you know, it's been done in other countries. It's awesome when you experience it. And if you do it with care and passion, people will like it. Mm. So I just started knocking on doors and bars, restaurants for months, for wow. months, getting rejected, rejected, rejected. My, my stomach was a knot. <laughs> wow. And yeah. one, place was like yeah they would love to have that i was like okay here's my card give me a call let's talk about it and he didn't call and i went back wow. after one year <laughs> and i was like you never called it was he was like i missed your card let's do this wow. this saturday and that's the first bar that opened the doors he was actually wanting to do it but he lost my card so wow yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> Jeez. That, so had you ever seen a restaurant or bar magician before starting to do it yourself? In Greece? No. Wow. Huh. No. But you had you yeah. had seen yeah. one somewhere else or on video? Yeah, yeah. On video, you know, uh, I've seen Garrett Thomas uh, mm. and Justin Miller and his strolling hands. Uh, so yeah, wow. I had an idea. I mean, I've seen the L and L tapes, but I had yeah. an idea how would table hopping work. Or like yeah that's so interesting like obviously in america it is more prominent to have obviously. restaurant or bar magicians but i was in a similar boat in that i had never seen a restaurant or bar magician before in person before i started reaching out to places seeing if yeah. i could perform at them you know and eventually i got like consistent restaurant gigs so it was a kind of similar thing but i guess i was luckier being in america that it was only like place three that I talked to that then I got the opportunity to perform at. Oh, um, yeah. you know, Mine I just found I just found a place three. that would normally have music. And then I was like, if they have music, maybe they would want magic. Yeah. But the idea of like trying to explain to a restaurant or bar who have never seen magic at their like before I, in person, I broke that they need it once. Is, well, I broke, broke once. once. And what do you oh, really? What do you mean? Because you just, <laughs> uh, I just told this place that would, that would arrange weddings, and I was like, mm. I, I had an offer to, to make you and all that. I'm a magician, and I, you know, it's a it's a wonderful thing to do magic in weddings because there's always a time where you know the couple is out taking photographs and everybody's just waiting for them. And that's mm. where I come in, yeah. and he goes like, "Yeah, but the, the there won't be any kids around," and I was like, I'm "Not doing it for kids. This is adult entertainment. This is something mm. I do for adults." And I want you to imagine, blah, 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 blah. I start talking to him. And then it goes like, are, are you going to have uh, pigeons and doves? I'm like, no, no, no. Close up um, items. Yeah, just cards, really just coins, and all it. that. And after a while, he goes like, again, yeah, but we don't, I don't think there will be any kids. I'm like, I've just told you, there are, are, this is not for kids. This is for no, adults. Wow. Yeah. And in, in the end, it just, I don't remember what I told him. I told him something horrible to hang up. <laughs> But it's, um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, it can feel really belittling to feel like, oh, you know, this guy just doesn't get it. He really just thinks that I must be like a clown kids entertainer. Like he's yeah. putting me in that box when I'm like a serious performer. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Wow. It's, I, don't, I don't know because I, 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 I truly believe a lot of kids, children entertainment is serious performance as well. Mm -hmm. More, more rare because, you know, a lot of people are just a size up. They don't think it over much and don't actually care much about the kids but i have seen kids entertainers that are really good at what they do they adore children and they're doing it really well and i think it's it's, it's also you know a bad stereotype you know to dismiss yeah. them because you know i used to do it as well it's like we're doing magic okay yeah do it in a wedding i do just it. find it hard i just find it very difficult to do kids entertainment 
Oh, and like it's I, I, I I, it, it's it. a I skill. It. It's an entirely different skill, and I have nothing but respect for people that can that can do it because I can't. <laughs> and I'm not. I, I I cannot as at all anymore. I mean, I used to do it for for a few years, mm-hmm. and in the end, I was like. I don't, I'm not having fun here. I mean, I, yeah. I began doing magic professionally because I wanted to, you know, to also have fun in the process. Yeah. Not, yeah. To enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's not fun. No, I, I had a couple rough kid gigs and then I was like, never again. No. And I think I was, I had just gotten out of high school or something and, <laughs> you know, but I was just like, nope, not doing kid gigs. Um, it's so, it's, it's very difficult. And I think also, if you get booked for kid gigs, it's difficult to not be put in the category of like, you are just here to babysit these children while yeah. the parents are. That, that's what the parents, that's what the parents feel like most of the time. Yeah. A it's lot like, of yeah, times. We have, yeah. You just yeah. take them out of the way so we can have some drinks with the rest of the parents. That's the, the premise. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, now, so you, needed to basically convince these people that they needed magic uh, that, or that it would be worthwhile to have magic at their venue and yeah. trying to break and explain to them close up magic as, uh, you know, as a form of entertainment, um, not just for kids. And it, it makes a lot of sense because the things that you perform wouldn't uh, that at least from what I understand of your repertoire, a lot of it wouldn't be tailed for, uh, tailored for kids at all. They wouldn't even necessarily get it because yeah. a lot of your, um, nar- your effects are very narrative based yeah. and storytelling driven, which yeah. is for adults. And do you feel like you went down that path um, in order to really show like this is a theatrical thing for adults or it just kind of naturally was your style or you were always interested in that? Like, No, I, I went through all, all the phases of, of mm. magic. I went through the yeah. street cool, you know, mm. Yes, I'm gonna fucking blame it, you know. Yeah, watch, I'm just gonna say nothing. watch, watch, yeah, watch, 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 watch. Yeah, I, I went through <laughs> that. I went through the more classic, uh, Vernon esque, you know, it's all about the trick, no no meaning behind it. You just, you're just gonna put the cards as slowly as possible in the middle, just gonna jump in the top and all that. Mm, yeah, but in, in the end, because probably because I grew up in an artistic family, I needed to find a venue to express myself. Mm. And you know, scripting became my uh, tool to incorporate magic into my self expression. Yeah. And you know, narrative, symbolic, metaphorical presentations. It's where I found my home, you know, just using the cards, using the coins, using mentalism as a means to convey a thought, an emotion, mm. a message. Yeah. And now this is something that we've gotten into a lot with. And I was just talking with a friend of mine, Ricardo Berdini, who we had on the show recently. Uh, or Well, we had him on the show when we did Instagram lives, so we should have mm-hmm. him back on. But we were talking about scripting and how to incorporate scripting into a close up context and still feel spontaneous and personable and not feel mm-hmm. like you're constructing a fourth wall with your spectator. Because I think that like, obviously in a, it makes sense for scripting if you're on stage, but yeah. if you're in a close up context, how do you go from a conversation into a script where without things feeling jarring or unnatural or like, Oh, whoa, he's suddenly into a per- performance. Not now we're not just talking anymore. You know? All right. So are we talking about a, a professional gig or in casual performance? Ah, I'd love to talk about both. Cause that's an interesting, because it's a different approach. Yeah. Because if I, if I go and, and perform some for you, if we're out for having drinks and I want to perform something for you, I yeah. can ease it into the discussion and, you know, show something yeah. that is relative to our theme or what are we talking about? Whereas in performance, it can still feel spontaneous. Oh, you vanished. Oh, there you are. <laughs> it can feel, feel spontaneous and uh, from the way you deliver your script. Uh, but in the end, it's, I mean, you need to start, you know, what you want to talk about because there are some themes and some metaphors if you may that mm. will never seem spontaneous if i have a, a piece of magic that talks about uh grief or loss which is something that we shouldn't be afraid or it shouldn't be taboo mm-hmm. to talk about through magic but i don't know how we would you put that or how do you how do you, how do you that segue in? on that yeah without really bringing the conversation so far down yeah. like to a real downer exactly. moment and then bring it back up 
Yeah, I mean, even like I was talking with um with a, a mutual friend of ours, Ethan, recently, mm. and uh, and Ethan's great, and we were talking about a project of yours. Which, if if you haven't checked this out yet, anybody in the comments, you should definitely check out the Medusa Project. It's called it's oh. called the Medusa Project, right? Yeah. Um, and just an incredible idea, incredible concept. I actually was talking to somebody on FaceTime yesterday, a friend of mine who's not a magician, and I was telling her. I was describing the Medusa project to her. I was just like, oh, there's this, uh, this friend of mine, this guy Perseus, and he has this really cool routine where he turns a deck to stone in front of you and all of the props start turning to stone. You're holding on to a Sharpie and a lighter and things just all start turning yeah. to stone. It's really incredible. And, right. uh, and she was freaking out just at the description of the routine. So that's oh, I, how powerful the concept is. So I, had I love the Medusa I'm afraid project. of shaking my hands. Yeah. I kid you not. I have people who afraid to go like finishing up, like, thank you so much. They're like, nope. Ooh, yeah, they don't want to right. touch you because they think <laughs> you're, they're going to turn to stone. Yeah, that's amazing. It's such an incredible concept. Yeah. And that is something where you're taking a this Greek myth and mm -hmm. then incorporating it into and bringing it to life visually. But how do you go conversationally? Because Ethan is somebody who doesn't perform professionally. He only mm -hmm. would be performing casually. And he was like, I don't know how in a casual context I could suddenly start going into this story about Medusa the Gorgon. Uh, is that a routine that you would perform in a casual context? And how would you kind of oh, absolutely. transition? No, so I, I have, okay, I have a this specific. Is, this, is, this is just for Ethan. <laughs> yeah, question. okay, just for Ethan. Uh, so I I personally have a very specific script around which mm -hmm. I perform Medusa. And that is, you know, uh, first of all, you know, asking, have you heard about Medusa and all that? And, you know, a lot of people know her, you know, that it's, it's a beast. It used to be this uh, beast that if you look her in the eyes, you turn to stone, right? But, you know, to me, all Greek myths have an underlying message, have a metaphor. And if, if mm. we think about it, I mean, to me, at least, you know, Medusa is the truth. You know, we all have truths inside of us, you know, that we're afraid to face. Mm. And if we do, we, we're afraid that we're going to get petrified. Mm. And so then I asked me, you know, so I want you to select one of these. What is your truth? And I spread the deck and all that. And they take... Mm. Uh, the deck and I, I take out this coin that we we have inside them in the Medusa project, which is basically a, a, the head of Medusa. Oh, the mirror the, and then the mirror the, in the back. The yeah, new, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, we I start with that. You know, I found this, and you know, you'll see there's a mirror behind because the only way to to face to face our own truths is firstly we face ourselves, and when we first do this, we don't accept it. We need to. Hide. So go ahead and mm. fog. try to hide yourself. They go like, and they see the number. And so, so you go, that, but that's half the truth. Mm. And I'll leave you with this. Even though you might feel that you're getting petrified, and even if you do get petrified, and then I change the whole deck, mm. that doesn't mean you should never face your truth. And I turn it over mm. and they see the card and all that. Now, oh, this, nice, yeah. in, a, in a casual setting, would be something more along the lines look what i found and just toss out the coin mm. i bought this in an old curiosity yeah. shop have you heard about medusa it's a fascinating myth you know just talk about the coin talk about the myth itself and all that yeah and and bring it out casually and then you can turn mm. it into oh a, yeah if you just found this thing you know yeah. and then suddenly it's just now people are hooked into the story and it doesn't feel like oh now he's going into a script it feels yeah, yeah. like, oh, I'm just, he's telling me a story. Like, yeah. And yeah. again, the, the good thing is because you use, you can use the shop, you can use the lighter, it can definitely happen in the offbeat. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. You, you can, you can light a cigarette or whatever, if you smoke or whatever, or just have the pen around, just take a note, take out the coin, talk about it, blah, blah, leave it on the table. And then at some point, switch the pen in the offbeat. Yeah. And, and just as in, a, talking, in a casual context, anything yeah. can be an offbeat. Yeah. Yeah. So in a, and, and in an office, you just tap it on the Medusa and just look at it and, and it's stone. Mm. And you're like, what? And you just, you know, act it out as a prank, you know, like, yeah. And just because people will freak out when they see that happening. And the, the, the funny part is, I, I, funny enough, they're in the boxes now. The, the actual Sharpie is gray. The, the stone mm. one is gray. Oh, yeah. It's great. So I if you it, put yeah. a Sharpie cap in the back of it, and hold it it looks like a sharpie yeah so all you need is to twist it and take out the cap <laughs> you can visually turn it to stone yeah that's yeah. Awesome. yeah really 
Same. That's great. Um, now, uh, how do you avoid when you are doing a scripted close-up performance? How do you avoid sounding robotic and sounding scripted? How do you how do you sound natural and make it feel <clears throat> organic? Most importantly, I honestly care about what I'm talking about. Mm. I don't script just because it's a cool premise. I script because I care about the subject. Mm. So it, people can tell. A, a lot of the times we, you know, we yeah. under, underestimate our audience's perception. You know, they will never see that. They will never get that or whatever. They see that. They're yeah. just being polite. And as, and as well as, you know, they can see non-authenticity. So if you script something that you truly care about, they will feel that. Also, I edit a lot mm. of it. If you script something and go out and, and perform it, it's going to be crap. Then you come back, you re-edit it, cut yeah. off duplicate duplicate words or add more if you need to emphasize something. I don't know. Mm. It depends on your style. But again, it, it depends how, what's the style? Because I have a very specific style when I perform. And again, not everyone's going to, not everyone's going to like that style or want to perform with that style so your scripting should be you know fitting with you mm. and how do you normally speak on how what subjects do you actually want to talk about yeah absolutely like who is and, your character and what is what's yeah. true to you exactly exactly and and don't, not every script needs to be deeply emotional or meaningful which i i want to believe that i have a lot of those but it could be just you know stuff that you just care about you yeah know? absolutely uh tigger t she has a question uh she said does the stone deck have a noticeable face and back yes it's a yeah. bicycle back and it's a five of spades in the face yeah and uh and then so if it was midas would people want you to touch things and turn them to gold any thoughts on a midas project may uh actually uh, there is uh eric mead at the moment is writing uh his mm. his book about tim conover's uh magic which oh, was a dear friend which has a midas whole, and he has midas a whole team. yeah whole midas uh routine in there especially you know with with, with a small coin mm. pouch that also turns gold and the coins turn to gold and it's a really nice routine. i think tim, uh, tim has a really cool routine with the shot glass uh appearing in their hand with the the silk yeah one of the there's a lot of goods i cannot wait for that book um uh, mark oberon had a great midas routine mm. uh you can you can find it on, on youtube at some point where he talks about uh the midas touch and starts turning numerous objects into into gold that's awesome so yeah, yeah. i think i've seen a few kind of midas themed routines uh, out there before um one with like origami but this brings us to a very important moment of the evening are Which you is? ready for the first jingle of the night everybody in the comments is ready they cannot wait for 20 questions it's time to get to know you a little bit better mr percy ladies and gentlemen it's that time it's time for 20 questions it's time for 20 questions yeah it's time for 20 questions it's time for 20 questions yeah put two minutes on the clock put two minutes on the clock put two minutes on the clock Get two minutes on the clock here we Right, we Go are ahead. taking over. We got a a browser source right here, which should be popping up. Hello, my timer. Hello, my timer. Hello. Well, my timer has ceased to work. So um, <clears throat> instead, we are going to uh, to just do it on my phone. That's totally fine. So you get two minutes on the clock, good sir. And uh, the way that this works is you have 20 questions, two minutes to answer these 20 questions. And we're going to, we're going to see how many questions you can get through in the two minutes. <clears throat> All right. Does sound good. So, okay. Yeah, that's right. All right. And I've got some, I've got a, a couple questions, some extra ones. So we'll see who's ready in the chat with some questions. And, uh, and then I've got some extra ones that we're going to add. So ready. And uh, three, two, one dream vacation destination thailand 
Biggest pet peeve. Pet peeve? Something you hate. I hate? Yeah. Um, copycatting. Biggest mistake during a performance. Um, hmm, hmm. Ah, uh, biggest mistake during a performance. Uh, making a joke <clears throat> that I'm used to do with with a friend of mine. But I'll, I'll explain afterwards. Bad joke. Bad joke. <laughs> bad joke. Okay. Um, favorite movie. What? Oh my god. Can I skip? Sure. Secret talent. Secret talent. I cook really well. What always makes you laugh? Farts. First time you ever saw a magic trick? Nine years old from a friend of my father. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Mind reading. Dream performance venue? Carnegie Hall. What's your most cherished memory? Most cherished memory when it comes to magic or in life? Just in life. My son's birth. Favorite food? Couscous. What's the worst job you ever had? Uh, moving uh, stuff from the port to a van, to a huge thingy. Who's More. your favorite magician? I... And that is time. Wow. So saved by the bell. You kind of <laughs> ass. <laughs> so I, I made it through not the most, however, comma, not the least. So it, it's good. It was yeah. uh, you made it through. 12 questions, actually. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. Out of 20. Yeah. So not too bad. 12 questions out of 20 is not too bad. I think that's one more than Chris Kenner. So that was good. Yeah, yeah. So the worst job you ever had was uh, was about like loading a, a, a stock freight from a port, basically. Yes, yes. That sounds pretty like rough. Pretty heavy, great. heavy stuff. I hated that. My body did as well. Perseus Jackson and the Archimanus Knight. Oh my God, you guys are the worst. Um, now we did have a little bit of we had a little bit of banter. We had a little bit of bant. We had uh, Lindsay said Tigger T, you can take this, and Tigger said No, Lindsay, you do it. You were good at it, and I said Okay. So there's one more question. Um, I like reading magic books for new ideas. What's old is new again, right? But, uh. <laughs> Lindsay, you dropped the ball. If do you ever have no time to read? <laughs> I want someone to read to me. LOL. Um, Funny okay. story. Yeah. Funny story. I got in my hands uh, a, a huge essay uh, about the magic of Gabi Paredes, right? And oh we're my talking gosh, about that sounds amazing. It is. It is amazing. And we had this talk about uh, with some friends in the uh, Discord. Um, I, I think it was Benjamin Francis. And so we were like, okay, we're both going to read it. And then tonight we're going to talk about it. Mm. And nobody did it because it's 15 pages. Yeah. So, and we, the days were going back. Like we, so, at some point, we need to read and all that. So at some point, we were like, you know what? Let's do it now. Let's read it live. I'm g we, we just paper, rock, paper, scissors it. I read it. And then we talked about it. Mm. And then we began this thing where we started reading random essays every night. Uh, we have this guy. Really? We have this guy called Alex Warnoff, who is basically a voice actor. So he's the perfect fit to read. Oh my things. gosh, Alex! It's so awesome whenever he reads anything because he has such a deep, booming yeah. voice. I mean, imagine Eric Tate on steroids is D <laughs> Dr. Warnoff. So we have him read us, and we record those. Er known and big as magic essays to us so it's basically like an audiobook and we were That's we were talking with awesome. the guys actually if i i'll maybe start putting out with orion magic productions some magic audiobooks so Lindsay, wow. you're in luck we might That's do that awesome because uh tigger t also said earlier um 
I know it's great when you have a team with you, no matter uh, what someone is trying to do, but I really like it when an author does the audio book for their own book. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay. when, uh, like uh, Darren Brown, he recently did the audio book for his own books uh, on audible and everything. Have you heard those? No, not yet. Um, he I've has... read them, but I haven't heard them from. Uh, do you have, uh, do you have any like audio books that you've listened to recently? No, I, I read a lot. I, I read I'm a lot. not big into the audiobook game. You're really into the audiobook game, right? You're really big into the audiobook game, right? No, the opposite. The that, opposite, um, the opposite not, of the opposite, because you are I'm so not, into the audiobook game. That's why you want <laughs> everybody to know that they can go to audibletrial.com slash magic where they can get any free audiobook. For example, Darren Brown's Boot Camp for the Brain. Available on Audible. Try it for free with audibletrial.com slash magic. And after you're done, if you're looking to pay some money after you get this free gift from us and support the show, you can also go and support Perseus's magic essay audiobooks with Dr. Vernoff whenever they come out. Was that a seamless transition, Perseus, mayhaps? Is that a, uh, was that I am a st- not a smart man. I it took me a while. Was but, that, did yeah. you like that segue? I, that was, uh, yeah, not bad. <laughs> was not bad <laughs> I just bullied you into agreeing with me. I go, you are a big audiobook fan. And like, no, you, you didn't hear me well. <laughs> you go, no, the opposite. I go, no, I heard you. <laughs> you said <laughs> you love yeah. audiobooks. Uh, is Persia, is Perseus Jackson and the Archimedes Knight on Audible? Um, Persis. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to check it out. If you're interested in the Percy Jackson series, though, they that is available on yeah, Audible. Probably. Have you read the Percy Jackson series? No, I no. Have you avoided it just out of like spite? It's not spite. It's like you know, it's. Uh, I, I really, I really enjoy the Perseus original myth, and yeah. I, I don't get me wrong. They might took it and made something amazing with it, but just so much other things that need to read that I don't have the time. So it's just, I don't want to put this as well. Mm, yeah. Lindsay said, Percy, have you ever been gaslighted before? <laughs> Maybe I was gaslighting you a little bit hard earlier. Um, yeah, just, What's uh, oh, uh, I mean, gaslighting. Okay. So, well, have you ever heard the term gaslight? No, that's what I'm asking. Okay. So gaslight is almost like, um, in Among Us, if you ever play in Among Us or something, and then yeah. I try and you saw you saw me, you know yeah. I murdered somebody, but I try to convince you that you've seen something wrong. Like I try okay. to convince you you're misremembering. That's gaslighting somebody. Okay. So I think that Lindsay was just making the joke that I was kind of gaslighting you by trying to convince you you liked audiobooks. Okay. Now there's yeah. actually there's actually an old movie. Um, I think it came out in 1944 or 1946 and it is called Gaslight and it's kind of the origin of the term. And it's about how there's this woman who um, she's dating this man and they're living in her old home for, that she lived in when she was a child. And her mother, I guess, was murdered or something. So her mother's murdered. And oh, so shit. the house is abandoned for a long time and they move back into this house. And suddenly she starts like seeing things and he basically convinces her, her husband, her new husband convinces her that she's seeing things where he, and the term gaslight comes because he was flickering the gas lamps and making her think that the, she thought that the lamps were lowering and raising when really he was doing it. So then he was trying to convince her she was going insane that way he could rob her was basically kind of part of the premise. So then the term gaslight has reached oh, the wow. lexicon. Yeah, yeah. So people will usually use the term gaslight if they're talking about like partners, like um, like in this Amber Heard Don- Johnny Depp trial, they were mm-hmm. saying like, like um, her lawyer was saying like, oh, was Johnny Depp trying to gaslight you, Amber? So that's kind of the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. No uh, more you Lindsay, know. Lindsay, are you trying to convince me that this is the origin story of gaslight? Yeah. Yeah. Lamest segue ever. Guys, we're trying. We're telling stories. Okay. So then uh, now the current venture has been with Orion. And you've put out some incredible products with Orion already. We have produced the project. And I feel like you've hit the market really fast with some great releases. Um, Now, 
you have the the thing that Tony was showing people at Blackpool. Is that coming out soon? Yeah, and not not soon, not soon, That's sooner okay. than expected. But okay. it will take some time. The memorizer. Okay, because that yeah. was awesome. That was like the talk of the convention. I was trying to tell yeah. everybody to check that out, and talked with somebody about that the other day as well. Such an amazing routine. And, uh, and so now, but you have a few things that are in the works that are coming up. Is there yeah, anything yeah. that you can, uh, you can tell everybody about that, uh, that's coming up? Uh, it's, uh, a lot. There's this, uh, so I have this series of booklets it's called, uh, called the annuals because mm-hmm. if all goes well, I will we'll be, I uh, will be producing 12 of those every year. Mm. Uh, hence the name. Uh, so the third one of the series is called Jurassic. Wait, wait, wait. They, sorry, excuse me. They're called the annuals because you're think you're going to produce twelve of them every year. Every yeah. year, okay. So one a month. Yeah, okay. not one a month, but twelve of them at the end of the year. So okay, gotcha. It's I mean, let's be realistic. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the third one of the series is uh, called Jurassic Gram. It's by Leonardo Flores. Uh, it's it's a really mm. nice uh, mentalism routine that also yeah Leo was telling me about this it's really cool yeah it, it comes with really good uh, with really nice uh, cards uh, when you have you can have you want you have this uh, a routine around uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, beautiful movie it's, it's it feels nostalgic and you know it's uh, yeah it's really atmospheric and nice you know and the thing is that the method idea like that that Leo sh- told me and showed me the performance is cool but what really makes this is your designs for the uh the cards it's like i think that you've really made it into something really polished it looks really really nice actually that is the book oh awesome wow that is the cards your packaging is so great oh thanks so much appreciate it actually these are leo's designs really oh wow i will i will okay. not take credit for another artist's uh oh, wow. backs. i he showed no. them to me and i thought that he said that, okay yeah yeah i thought that all you right, all right all right mind. have you seen the movie i a long time ago like you, not like not recently enough to recall specific details from the movie okay what's the first thing that comes to mind first dinosaur the first thing that comes to mind from the whole movie uh, uh, T Rex. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's okay. a lie, Blaze. What's the exactly, first? Thing? I don't know exactly what you thought about. What does that say? <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. We, we, that's the first but, thing that comes to mind is Jeff Goldblum. You're right. Actually, of, that's a hundred percent right. So yeah, but there are dinosaurs there. There's a we, we have a couple of Jeff Goldblum cards because it's a it's a nice joke by Aaron Ducker and Benjamin Francis that oh, was that's added fun. in the no, set. I love but that, and, and that that all comes from Discord. That all comes from, from Discord jamming. This entire oh, yeah. release came from Discord jamming, right? And it's beautiful, and it's beautiful. It's like, like there is that is something that I and I meant I had a whole section about this in my lecture in in Blackpool talking about. Discord has completely changed the way I think that I create and a lot of my friends create. I think that it's become a huge part of the creative process of having that collaboration. And I actually look more towards my little Discord community rather than like in-person jamming ideas with people I know. But that's the thing that, I mean, Leo came with all that. And uh, at some point he was talking about with us and Aaron Ducker, this Australian weird beast. So it was like <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was thinking of uh, because he was, he was doing the routine to him and he nailed the dinosaur. But as a joke, he was like, I was thinking about uh, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. Oh, man. and they were like, and just it stemmed up and then it ended up, you know, being part of the part of the routine because you know it's like it's a, it's a, also a, a nice joke you can have with you. You know, it's uh you could do the routine in the end. You kind of the oh, I would so show. muck in the Jeff Goldblum card and just leave that on the table. Oh, I, I, every, I, everybody says that. Everybody yeah. loves that. If that's included yeah. in the set, I love that so much. That's <laughs> great. Wow. And we're also be going to be producing uh, a set of uh, how should I call those? Do you like sponge balls? Oh, you showed me. The, can I say what they are? Yeah, you can say what they are. Yeah, so Perseus has 
talked about creating things that are true to himself and has a wide range of creativity from <laughs> Greek ancient myths to marshmallows. This is awesome. I, I'm so mm. excited for this release. This is actually really cool. And the only I think the only kind of SpongeBob like thing that I would ever use because I would that, never I would never carry around sponge balls. But that, if I went that, to a bar, exactly. like a barbecue or something and I had some marshmallows, that would be amazing. And that's the, the, the reason that this came up is I love SpongeBob routines. I love the impact that SpongeBob's have, but I could never justify those damn red balls. So I was like yeah. marshmallows make sense because they, they are they have the same kind of density yeah. and all that. So we have this around here. There it was so, this yeah. little bag. This little bag here. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a full set and uh, numerous routines. It's also a change bag, so you can change. Mm. The have you? Ha uh, can you say the name of what they're going to uh, call? Mellows. Mellows. Okay, it was Mellows. Because I think yeah. when I first joined the call, you were still thinking about names, but that was still the best one at the time. Yeah. And it, yeah, and I think everybody still loved Mellows. That's such a great name. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Like, I'm going to definitely a actually use these. And it was funny uh, the other day, if uh, if anyone's interested in um, our Patreon members, there's a thing we do called the Weekly Patter. And on the Weekly Patter, that's an extra podcast that's just for our patrons. I did the Weekly Patter this past time and was reacting to just weird n magic and bad magic trailers. And there's a new product that's come out that's a COVID-related trick where where you turn a you turn a negative covid test to a, or you turn a positive test to a negative test That's horrible. and so i was like roasting that routine on the weekly patter and then i looked up new other routines that are have come out and there was one that was like this loading device and i think it, hansen chen was involved and it was so high tech and it looked like a james bond kind of um device and trailer no, no, and it was so the jumbo epic. coin one yeah the jumbo coin one and it's such yeah, an epic, a lot of those yeah the, the such an epic a trailer look, yeah. yeah and then they show a montage of all of the other uses other than the jumbo coin one and it's like an epic trailer and then he loads like a bunch of red balls onto his hand and i was like it's just such a crazy thing to think we have like this James Bond esque cinematic trailer, and then you're using it to make red balls appear. And so I think having a much more organic prop that doesn't feel weird. Like if you go to anywhere, I mean, obviously the SpongeBob routines are really cool in that they get great reactions, mm -hmm. but you are always the guy who is carrying around red balls. And so any setting that you go in, that's never natural. There's no setting that that's really organic in that you would have red balls. But there are a lot of settings where it would make sense to just have marshmallows. Like and, and the thing is, you, know, you, like, can, you can actually carry this around because as I said, it's going to be also a uh, change bag. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Basically, you can start off clear change camping. bag. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Talking about, uh, you know, uh, camping, talking about friendship, you know, sharing stories and all that. Perform your sponsor routine. And in the end, because they feel it, you tell them that obviously that's that's a metaphor though. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about sharing, why don't you have some real ones and just put it put it in, do the change, just actually give them actual marshmallows here. It just bye bye. It's, you can be, create beautiful routines and you know it's like you can also do it in kids' parties. You know. You could also do kids' parties. You could do it wherever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a great prop, great idea. And uh happy you're putting that out. The, the, I the, much the, I much the, prefer the, it to the uh to the Oh man, the Adam Wilbur, um, the weed sponge balls that he put out that were just that is green too niche, balls. Too niche. I was just opinion. like, oh yeah, too niche. Too I mean, niche. It was just wild. I was like, this is not. I just felt like, yeah, too niche. Too niche. Uh, but Tigger, niche. yeah, Tigger T said, are red balls better than blue balls? Well, blue balls are the worst. So we're gonna move on from there. Yeah, I mean, um, Ryan Edwards is here. The man, the myth, the legend, the one and only mentalist has joined us. Um, I hope you're doing well, Ryan. Now, Ry since Ryan is here, Ryan, do you want to jump in for purple? Because we, we're approaching the best segment of the evening. So I'm going to I'm going to give Ryan a second to, uh, okay. to chime in. Should I be worried? And we'll see. I, I think you should be very worried. I mean, if you combine <laughs> red balls and blue balls, what do you get? Tigger T, you get you purple. get purple. Yeah. So it, I think it's about time for purple. Now, if Ryan can't jump in, then I'll, I'll have to do it without him. But that's fine. I'll, I'll jump. I'll do the purple. 
What do you mean I'll do the purple? You what 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 does that even mean? Dude, you got it. It's it's the best. It's amazing. This is what everybody's been waiting for the entire show. Uh Anya can't get to sleep downstairs. It's okay, Ryan. It's all good. I will do the purple without you, but just know that my heart goes out to you, my big bro, and that we will miss you on this great day. Now, uh, Mix of Tricks says, people's, this, I think this is Andrew Niner, says, people say I look like Joshua J. Percy says I look like Joshua J. Is oh, it's Rocket. Thing now? It's Rocket? Yeah. It's, it's definitely Joshua J's long lost son. That's, yeah, long lost son. I met, Absolutely. I met Rocket at, uh, at Nemcon. Cool dude. And, uh, yeah, very much fun times. I'm just going through the chat, seeing if anybody has any other questions before we do the best section. Lindsay said, have you seen a drive through magician? <laughs> I'm a serious clown. No jokes, just TED Talks. That would be awesome. But now, uh, Persis, you've been able to make that distinction. And uh, now, at this point, have times changed when it comes to close-up magic in Greece? Like, where there are other performers and it's seen as a serious profession? Or do you have much competition? Or are you kind of the only guy locking it down? I I, I mean, again, you know, it's how you, you approach it. I, I a lot of other magicians have started doing it as well, which nice. only can make me happy. And I don't feel I have competition. I am me. I don't. It's different than the next, and he's different than the next, and all that. I don't think there's enough bars and restaurants for all of us. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm just happy that you know it's starting to catch on, you know, and people just giving magic a chance because it's, mm. if you truly like it and you really want to make a living out of it, well, go out in there and work. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have reached a serious you're, moment. You're, you're dying for this purple thing. Go Dude, the, are, the, are you ready? Are you ready? I am it's not. It's a serious purple. moment of the show. This is real serious. Ready? Three, two, one. Lasagna. Lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat. Lasagna. Veggie. Lasagna. Plain. Lasagna. Saucy lasagna! What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Keller! Lasagna! Cheese! Lasagna! Bolognese! Lasagna! Lasagna! Blame! Houdini! What's yours? What's yours? Blaine Houdini. See, even though he couldn't make it tonight, he still made an appearance. The incredible Ryan Edwards, voice of an angel. What's your favorite genre of lasagna, Mr. Archimanes? Meat. Meat is your genre? Yep. Okay. All right. I like carnivore in general. Like carnivore. So carnivore lasagna? Carnivore lasagna would be my favorite. I like carnivore. I think that's a, a better sounding genre because I feel like meat is almost an ingredient, you know? Yeah. No, you know? carnivore lasagna. Yeah, carnivore lasagna. All right. So what kind of meat? Would this be like beef? Would this be pork? This yeah. would be... Yeah, probably, like, beef. probably beef. Beef or both. Or you know, both. have you tried... ¿Por qué no los beef? dos? Be <laughs> Yeah. We. <laughs> what, what the fuck? <laughs> so... Beef and pork grounded together. Beef and pork grounded together. And what what is that like a particular combination? Is that called something when you have beef and pork ground together? Or you're just saying you want that on your lasagna? No, we, we, we do that in, in numerous uh, uh, recipes where ground meat mm. is. Uh, and we want to make it more rich. Mm. <laughs> we put both. Instead. I was thinking about planning a, a, an impromptu trip to Athens soon, and I have a friend who's going to Mykonos. So what is uh, some Greek cuisine that's uh, that's really popping over there? What is uh, the most popular uh, Greek dish? Uh, I mean, you're talking about Mayhaps dish lasagna. or yeah. like street food because it's a different thing. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, let's go with like dish, and then we could do street food. Muzaka, muzaka, yes, muzaka. 
That sounds Muzaka. dope. Okay, so what is Muzaka? Is, I've never heard of this. This is like one of the most popular dishes. Potato. Imagine it on a on a tray, right? Uh, yeah, or Google it. <laughs> well, I'm having a tough time googling. Oh, Musaka. Yes. Okay, that's not how I thought to spell it. Okay, Musaka, Greek food. Okay, traditional Musaka recipe. Let's take a gander. With potato and this is just lasagna, bro. No, 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 no. There's no lasagna. What are you doing? There Wait, look no at the graphic and then lasagna. Musaka. <laughs> No, it's not. Da, no. Da, da. Musaka. Musaka. Dude, no. it's just musaka. Dude. There is no it's lasagna. lasagna. What's your favorite? The, that on top musaka. is bechamel. That's on top is bechamel. Surely musaka is similar to lasagna. No, it's not. Dude. No, Dude, it's, it's not. just potato lasagna. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is potato, this eggplant, is grounded Whoa. meat. <laughs> wait, wait. This says, what is the difference between lasagna and musaka? There Moussaka is to the Greek what lasagna is to the Italians. A rich tomato meat sauce layered with eggplant instead of pasta sheets. So it's just eggplant and potato instead of pasta? Yeah. Dude, this but is the also, kind of lasagna. This is what I would go also, for. Is there cheese on it? Occasionally. I mean, it depends who makes it. But not necessarily? Not necessarily, no. Dude, my favorite genre of lasagna is moussaka. This is what I've been. Is it that's moussaka? Kind, moussaka? Kind of moussaka? Moussaka is moussaka. what, how, why, what moussaka. we call them. But it's moussaka. called moussaka. No, moussaka. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, it says layering it all up lasagna style. This is amazing. This just blew my mind. So this is a new lasagna that I've discovered uh, that you've shown me. You've introduced into my life. And well, I'd when... count this as a genre of lasagna. Oh, you should add it to the graphic then. Yeah. When, when is your friend going to make on us? Uh, in like a week. Gosh. I thought Musaka died and Scar took over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Lindsay Musaka was killed. Best. He didn't die. Lindsay he was has killed. The best comments. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so now here is... An important question, all right? And it might be two different answers depending on if it was lasagna or moussaka. moussaka. <laughs> right. But um, so here's here's the question. Oh, thanks so much for watching, Fiddlin' Johnny. Peace out, man. Happy you enjoyed. Trying my best to hold down the fort while my main man's out of these streets. Okay, so the question is, let's say that you have a carnivore lasagna, right? A single carnivore lasagna. And then you bake a second identical carnivore lasagna. You then take said second identical lasagna and place it atop the first. So now, do you have one or two lasagna? You have a tower of lasagna. A tower? Is that one tower or is that two? It would be a lasagna tower. It would be like a Jenga L lasagna Jenga. I don't know. Like I a mean, lasagna Jenga? It's a one. It's a one. I think it's a, it's still it's a one. It Amazing. One. It is one lasagna Jenga a tower. Big one fat one. So now if I pull out one of the layers of pasta of this Jenga, is it if still you, one? Yeah. And yes, it is. Unless you drop them, A, you lose. And B, it spreads out, so it's more than one. Now, what ha what is this? What is this slice? Now, is this like one tenth of the lasagna jenga, and it's then this is still one? So now, do I just is this an infinite lasagna printing glitch that every slice that I take out of this jenga becomes its own entity, but also I have one full entity here that exists simultaneously? It makes total sense in my mind. I agree, which is why we sell flying off the shelves lasagna mathematics hoodies. Lasagna Mathematics, $49, and you can be a proud supporter of the All Access Magic podcast at allaccessmagic.com slash shop. Also, there's a Lasagna Mathematics t-shirt because it's getting pretty toasty out right now. You can be a proud owner of this like some of our, uh, our recent listeners who have been actually buying this, which is amazing to all of us. Can this apply, though, to Muzaka, that mathematics as well? That's what I was going to ask you next is Muzaka Mathematics. Muzaka? Okay, so if you baked a Muzaka, right, would you bake it? 
I guess you yeah. bake it, right? Yeah, yeah you, you, bake. You, you take the best one else. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you bake the muzaka. I think if you take this and you stack another one on top of it, I mean, it's got to be one, right? It is one. Like, I think it's got to be. Big fat Hon- Hondo P. Hondo P. Now, okay, now here's the difference, though. This uh, muzaka has a, a pretty, it has a pretty thick layer on top. Yeah, that's that seems bechamel. to be different from the middle layers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the top one is bechamel. The top one is bechamel, but there's mm-hmm. not necessarily a bechamel throughout. Well, this one, this one looks just like lasagna. At this point, if you stack it, yeah, 100. Mm-hmm. percent Oh, now we've got some questions. If you stack a muzaka on top of a lasagna, what do you get? <clears throat> is that one? I tiger? think that I think that's what creates a black hole, and we that creates a black the, hole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now have you ever heard of a liger before yeah yeah so it might be like a liger kind of situation because this is what happens when a uh what is it a tiger breeds with a lion it's been a male lion and a female tiger breed and then you get a liger so we might get a lazaka or muzanya <laughs> muzanya I, I prefer muzanya I think Muzanya is the way the way to go. That's amazing. You just blew my mind, dude. I've my horizons have been broadened. So now when it comes to street food though, in these streets, what is the best street food? Souvlaki. Uh, souvlaki. That so it's like souffle. No. No. Souvlaki. Yes. Oh, so these are like kebabs? No. <laughs> oh. Like uh, gyros. Oh, it's like a gyro, but but these are on sticks. It, hence the name, souvlaki. Souvlaki. Okay, so Su- souvlaki is basically the And then the you put it... Oh, and then you make a gyro out of it? Uh, no. So souvlaki is basically the, the, the whole thing with the pita. So you either put gyros in it, kebab, or that stick, and just pull the stick out where the squares remain in the pita. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. yeah. It is. It is amazing. Mm. I mean, that's the most known Greek, Greek street food. Yeah. Yeah. Did I ever tell you that I was, I'm obsessed with mythology and have been since I was a little kid with Greek mythology? Greek mythology? Greek mythology. Absolutely. Really? I'm so obsessed with Greek mythology and have been since I was in, I think, third or fourth grade. And, uh, and then my favorite video game for the longest time was Smite. I was obsessed with that game, which is all about different gods from different cultures fighting each other. And uh, yeah, so it's really cool seeing the fact that you reflect your Greek culture and history and everything in your performances. Do you have other acts that you include in your show aside Absolutely. from uh, aside from like the Medusa act that are Absolutely. based on? I have a, a piece. Uh, I have a piece called Prometheus. A piece called Cassandra. Oh wow. Uh, I mean, I wear Athena <laughs> with a, in every performance. This is a uh, ring that belongs to my mother. It's like the goddess. Oh, wow. uh, uh, I use, I mean, I kind of reference Midas, one of my pieces. And I, I adore Greek mythology and worldwide mm-hmm. mythology as well. Like, I think, you know, mm-hmm. what that, it's, the, you know, it's the beginning of storytelling, you know? It's, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. And it's some of the best storytelling. Yeah. yeah. I've done so many reports on the Odyssey. <laughs> just like kept going back to it. Like, I mean, some of the Homer is just some of the best storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he is. Yeah. He was. He is. Was. Well, yeah. Whoever he or they were. They, are. Yeah. 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 And now, is that uh, reflected also in like your religious views at all? Are you spiritual in any sense? No. I mean, I'm not religious. Mm. I mean, I am spiritual when it comes to human spirit Mm. and uh, belief in humanity and their their abilities. Mm. That kind of like interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, uh, do you feel like that's right? Yeah. What were you going to say? I I wouldn't wouldn't call myself religious by any means. Mm. Or even spiritual. I mean, it's different thing 
maybe spiritual in a certain way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I imagine that there's something spiritual about just like being there in Greece and just the experience of getting to see all this ancient architecture and art around you. Like that Absolutely. sounds like it would be an incredible, amazing experience. I, w- I would argue it's the same thing, just being a magician. Mm. I mean, having all that the, that power in your hands because we do have power. We have forgotten about it, but have amazing yeah. power in our hands. Or the yeah. power to shape someone's day, you know? Yeah. By, by having a horrible day and with just something beautiful, you can make that. That's power. That's magic. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a spiritual experience as well. It is. Yeah. There's something, it, it almost reminds me of um, like the concept of in mythology that you would go to the sages or like to the oracles, you know, and like you'd go to the oracles and then you would be given this prophecy or you'd be shown the future. And, and there's even, there's even now research saying that that's related to like psychedelic experiences and things. Mm -hmm. Um, But they, they were being guided on this, spiritual kind of trippy experience and with a with a magic moment you can you're not going to that extent but you can bring people on a journey in the middle of their day and, and you can get to that crazy extent. experience yeah i had people you know burst out crying in, in my mm. in performance of mine you know people hugging you people thanking you about for, for the experience you know you touch some chords some strings mm. in their hearts that it just it feels cathartic mm. if you do it authentically and you we are being present, people can feel that. Mm, absolutely. What do you feel really does that the most to people? Connection, you know, Connection, authenticity. Yeah. Feeling yeah. You know, f- feeling that and, and again, it is it is about being because I view magic as an art form, consider myself an artist, right? And that is not something that happens by accident. It's a choice. Mm. And in order to do that, you need to also make a conscious choice of being vulnerable towards mm. your, in front of your audience. Because I cannot yeah. come to you and tell you, uh, I want to show you a piece of magic around fears. What's your deepest fear? Most deepest fear? Mm. You'll be like, I don't, don't yeah. want to tell you. But yeah. if I start and say, hey, uh, I want to present to you a piece of magic about fears. Now, my personal and the most deepest of all my fears is so and so. It'll be much mm. easier later on if they ask you, you know, what is yours? Mm. To, share that with me because you know we're in fair ground yeah and so if you're not ready to be vulnerable and open in front of the audience don't expect them to be if you don't consider if you don't take magic seriously don't expect your audience to to see it seriously absolutely yeah i think that's a great piece of advice absolutely i think that's a a gold nugget moment right there but i'm sure that we'll have or this is the right all access magic gold nugget but we'll have i'm sure a lot of uh people in the comments that might be beginning performers themselves or people that even do gigs or professionals or whatever, and might be thinking, you know, I do magic and I get people to freak out, but I've never had that moment of, um, of like having a deep emotional connection or reaction from somebody to the point where they're crying or it's something more than just a like, holy shit kind of moment. You know, what would you say? took your magic to that level breaking it down and understanding that magic has specific targets it's the senses mind and the heart the first thing that it hits is the senses because they see they feel they hear the magic then it goes up to the mind where they process the whole thing and if you don't script if you don't present it meaningfully if you don't express something you won't hit the Mm -hmm. third target you won't hit the the motion and i'd say you know find themes find uh something to express that you truly care about through your magic and people will relate if i i show you a piece of magic about love Mm. everybody can relate to that or Mm. mother's love Let's take that, you know, about, you know, one of the most powerful emotions in, in, the, in yeah. the world, you know, a mother's love. And there's been stories told about in uh, documents of, you know, mothers, you know, just left in cars to save their kids and all that. And if you do uh, something around that and, you know, instead of fucking having them sign a card meaninglessly, have them write yeah. their mother's name or something according mm-hmm. to the theme. 
it instantly becomes more meaningful. It creates a connection with a card, with a piece of magic, with you, the performer, that will lead to an emotional reaction afterwards. And be ready because it's not going to be a blame reaction. People gasp, people hold their chests, people stay silent. And that's where you need to let it sink in. Mm. Don't crack a joke. Don't make a comment. Let it sink in. Yeah. Mm. Wow, absolutely. Yeah. There's so many like important details to then that can l allow a performance to go to that deeper level. How do how, when you want to incorporate a metaphor? How would I ask this? How would you? How do you? ensure that when you incorporate a metaphor into a performance or a symbolism that it doesn't feel contrived because you have to make it make sense mm -hmm. because um and again as i said it doesn't have to be an emotional one it could be something you care about so do uh do you like books do i what do you like books oh like books yeah literature yeah do you know who Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is? Yeah. Creator of? Of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. yeah. So, what was Sherlock Holmes' job? Sherlock Holmes was a detective. Exactly. And he's known for his ability to use deduction to solve the, the, um, the mysteries and the crimes, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what we're going to illustrate, if you don't mind. Okay, awesome. I'm excited so for this. We want to make you big. We're going to need a possibility because deduction is exactly that. He basically will walk into a, a crime scene. He will have all possibilities in his mind, eliminate what didn't fit, whatever remained was the truth. Right? Okay. So bear with me. As, I, as all those possibilities pass through your eyes, I want you to go bang as if you're killing a playing card. Right? Okay. All right. And this is the weapon. Here. And bang. You want more or less? That's fine. You want the top one or the bottom one? Top one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, I, when, yeah, I would do that if there was more people because I would need some witnesses to the crime. Because mm -hmm. at this moment, all possibilities are open, right? Mm hmm now, I took out the two jokers, which will represent our perception, right? I imagine the two jokers as two parentheses. And because all possibilities are open, one goes to the bottom, one goes to the top, grabbing all possibilities. Okay. What will happen? You're going to give me clues. You're going to give me some clues. We're going to eliminate possibilities as the deduction works, and hopefully we'll end up to the truth. But in order to, you know, bring the magic into it, you won't say a word. Okay. Everything will happen up here. You ready? Mm -hmm. Think. Do not say. The color of the card, if it was red or black. Okay. Are you thinking about it? Mm -hmm. And I want you to notice the moment the first Joker vanishes. Mm -hmm. The moment the second vanishes from the bottom. Mm -hmm. When I say vanish, they don't disappear. They're still on the deck. They just change places. They appear, they come closer together, eliminating possibilities. Now imagine the first one dropped a few possibilities mm. downwards as the second one has risen a few up, you know, eliminating some from the top, some from the bottom. Nice. Now, you know, in the deck of cards, there are 52 possibilities, there are 52 cards. So we have 52 possibilities to begin with. How many would you say that we have left in between? Uh Probably like 38-ish, I don't know. Give or take, right? Around 38. Yeah. Clue number two. Think, do not say. What was the victim wearing? Because it was either wearing a club, a spade, a heart, or a dime, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, are you thinking about it? Mm-hmm. I, I want you to imagine the parentheses coming closer together. Now you'll notice the first one has dropped further down as the second one has risen further up. 
leaving mm. much fewer possibilities. How many would you say are left now? Is that like 10-ish? Maybe 10-ish? I think this is a point where we can be, uh, you know, accurate. Because mm. in each uh, suit, there are 13 cards. So there should be 13 possibilities in between those two parentheses. Mm. For the last one, I'm actually going to take it away from my control altogether. I want you to think, do not say, of the final and most important clue. The face of the victim you brutally murdered. You're thinking about I remember, it. I remember the face like it was yesterday. Oh. <laughs> I want you to actually imagine the two parentheses ending up in the final five possibilities. Okay. Four, three, two, one. Now, if all went well, the crime and the mystery should be solved. Mm. And as Sherlock Holmes says in the books, we remove all possibility, whatever remains, however improbable, must always be the truth. Mm. Nice, nice. Now, this is not some, you know, deeper emotional piece of magic about, you know, existential, existential, whatever. It is my actual, you know, interest of how deduction works and how, you know, this character, Sherlock Holmes, supposedly solve the crimes. It, it, it is interesting to me. And this is mm -hmm. a way to kind of illustrate it, you know, grabbing clue by clue while eliminating possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is that you're, you're keeping it engaging throughout you know like rather than it being about the cards and having it be something and even just the selection process is like fun and interesting and engaging of like doing this you know and yeah you may and, instead of tell you tell me stop or whatever yeah. you know go bang as if you're king killing, killing playing card yeah it yeah, makes fun really and fun. If, if you yeah. do it in a group and you're and there are four people one is the you know the criminal and the other three are like the the witnesses that each and every one gives you the clue and it's it's, 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 know, it's uh, oh yeah it's really fun yeah to, absolutely to me, to me that's that's what it's about and in the end if you notice not about me at all mm -hmm. yeah you're the narrator you're telling the story yeah mm -hmm. it's not like how, look how good i am you know magic is happening it's happening for a reason to illustrate something specific and everybody's involved and we're having fun well yeah and i think this is something i was talking with people about earlier and it, it's I think magicians use the term patter a lot and that kind of undervalues the words coming out of their mouth, you know, because that, yeah. that is your script. That doesn't have to be just your patter, like some random words that can also be your narrative. That can be yeah. the thing that's guiding people along a story. And I think a lot of times magicians think of the words coming out of their mouth more like a caption at an art gallery or something like mm -hmm. just a little blurb, just to get you into the piece. And then you're going to watch, you look at the thing on the wall and that's the mm -hmm. trick. Um, the only issue is that usually magicians are doing tricks that aren't their own. So you, the, the art gallery piece on the wall <laughs> is, mm -hmm. is just like something they got at a shop and then they're writing the little blurb. And whereas like what it can be is that the magic can be the illustration within yeah. your story that highlights yeah. a moment and brings it to life visually. But your script is the actual narrative that you're bringing people yeah. along. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think we all, we all do both of those, you know, either side of those sometimes, but, uh, Xavier said, uh, how much for the magics where to get, take my monies. Well, that's so interesting that you ask because, if you're interested in some of Perseus's magic or magic from some of his friends, you can go to orionmagicproductions.com and here we can check it out right here. We've got some routines, routine by Perna. It's so interesting because I know some of the so many of these people through Discord. So we've got Bottle here by Perseus. We've got Cannibal King by Alan Rorison. We've got the Medusa Project. Incredible. Really well done site. Really well done packaging. Weren't you telling me that you... Um, Weren't you telling me that you had custom packaging for each one? Like every single package was different or something? The design, you mean? The design, not, yeah. Not the actual box. But yeah, the, the, if, if you notice the, the designs are like in each packaging, there is this hand-drawn illustration of what the effect is about, give or take. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. And there's also always a booklet 
with instructions inside apart from the uh from the video the download you you get you can also there's also an illustrated booklet where you can just skim through and see how it works and start playing with it Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a uh, it's really, really great. Now, I think I remember talking to you a while ago when we were talking about um, in uh, being in Greece, getting your inspiration from the things around you. Didn't you tell me that you tend to like at least once a year or something go up to is it Mount Olympus? Or yeah, every <laughs> summer. Every summer. Every summer. I, know, I know it sounds Olympus, it yeah. sounds pretentious. Like I have to go visit my father. Too. Yeah, no, but it's it, so my, cool. My, it, it, my so it just really does sound like Hercules going. Like I'm going to visit my father and gain inspiration and like. No, 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 it's not like that. It's my. That's where you wife. get your magic from. No, my wife's family is from there. Oh, okay. And we go up there every summer. We stay with the uh, in laws. You know. Uh, her parents and it's it's basically in the in the base of Mount Olympus, but it's uh, I go up in, in, Mount, in Mount a lot of times. There's also beach by, so it's beautiful. It's, it's, and it does refill my batteries. If it I does. don't go there every every yeah. summer, I feel like shit throughout the year. Wow, yeah, but yeah. it gives you that that recharge visiting your forefathers. <laughs> yeah, Greece. yeah, getting to see that. Yeah, and then are you pretty close to things like the Parthenon and and? Uh, I am, I am to to the Parthenon. Yes, I mean Mount Olympus is like five hour drive. Five hour. Oh wow, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Parthenon is uh, is I mean, like a half an hour. Mm. If if someone were to go to Greece, what would you say is the number one like historical artifact or thing that they should check it out? Check out. It it depends what you want to see of Greece because mm. you can come and see our you know islands and beautiful beaches, or you can come for the history and the ancient ruins and all that, which is a completely different approach. You know, islands is fun and relaxation and partying and all that. Ruins is like. And history and museums is more like you know more of an intellectual uh, mm, experience. Yeah. So it, it yeah. depends what you want to come. Uh, if you go to Mykonos, like your friend, he's yeah, yeah. definitely going to party. <laughs> no, it's just for party. Yeah, it's going to be a party time. Yeah, it's um, a beautiful, beautiful yeah. Uh, island as well. I'll be there in September. Oh, That's nice. Why I asked you when uh, when, when your friend. Oh, okay. Was. I see. Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, it's mostly, you know, it's like a high-end partying uh, island vibe over on my uh, Mykonos. That's that, from everything that I've heard. It seemed like that. It yes. seemed almost like Ibiza or something, where it's just yes. kind of like a yeah party island, but beautiful. Yeah. Um, wh when did Perseus receive his freedom from being the best gladiator? <laughs> <laughs> well, what? No, that would, you, 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 that, that there's no such thing. There's no such thing. Are we combining? Were there gladiators also in Greece? I know. Was that more of a Roman thing? That's yeah. Roman. That's, Roman. That's more of a Roman. We thing. had Olympics. We had we mm. did fight, but not in an arena kind of style with lions and death. It's more yeah. of a sport. <laughs> yeah. Um, with Rex said, so you're saying you didn't get the wooden sword? Well, I didn't. I didn't get the wooden sword. Wooden sword. What is uh, oh, what is your although, what were you say? although just be, now now I got the reference. Uh, Spartacus was actually Greek. Mm, oh yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Um, now yeah, and like uh, Thermopylae and everything. Um, now what? Uh, oh, what was I just gonna say? Uh, we had the. I just lost, and you're still a gladiator. Oh, you you talked about you had your Prometheus act, right? It's not an act. It's, it's a piece of magic. Prometheus uh, is a set every time. Yeah. It talks yeah. about knowledge and fire. Basically, you know, mm. it's uh, that Prometheus gave to yeah. um, to mankind, and how you know we value so much knowledge, but we forgot we forgot imagination. And Einstein once said that imagination is more important than knowledge, and it's my belief that we should use both. So basically, one of the spectators takes the role of knowledge, the other one takes the role of imagination, and together mm. we they create something beautiful. Oh, that's I'm basically sure that's the premise. A, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm sure that that's a really cool routine, especially yeah with Prometheus bringing fire. I was just very curious about it when you were listing some of the myths. I feel like a Sisyphus story would be really fascinating. You know, that. especially the idea found, of like this this inevitability of being dragged back down. I, I haven't found. I am. I would really like to 
find a way to talk about Sisyphus. And that- I mean, the, the most like basic, but I feel like it would be so contrived idea that comes to mind off the bat just now was like, like an ambitious card that's always going to the bottom or something like it rolls back down. I, know, I thought like about, back down. about that recently. I don't remember mm. where, if it was a Wednesday tip or something, because mm. we, I post tips every Wednesday. Info. Oh, really? Where can people Ryan, find that? Or Ryan Magic Productions uh, Instagram. Instagram. Oh, nice. Uh, and at some point, I, I actually I think it was there that you know we we take a lot of those routines for granted. Like you know, the ambitious card must come to the top. Why? Yeah. Why not make yeah. something that goes back to the top, to the bottom, or them? Yeah, like uh, it's strange that you mention it. And uh, I, I have a, I, I really want to use his for at some point. Mm. Cassandra is a really interesting uh, premise as well. I don't think I'm necessarily recalling the myth of Cassandra right now. What so, is the what is the premise for that? Basically, Cassandra was uh, Apollo fell in love with this beautiful woman named Cassandra, oh. so she he gave her the ability to see the future. She then rejected him. So he said, like, you know what? <laughs> I won't take back the gift because I cannot. But I also going to curse you that no one will believe you. So basically, a Cassandrian prediction is one that, you know, you say she was the one that said, you know, to the Trojans that, you know, mm-hmm. this horse is a trap. And she was like, oh, get off. It's oh, beautiful. Uh, Bring it in. So basically, she could see the future, but no one would believe her. And uh, yeah, I basically... I use the metaphor of, you know, a lot of times, you know, you have this gut feeling inside of you, you know, you believe some. Oh, doesn't she like go kind of insane or something? Cause like, yeah, yeah cause she end. can see the future, but nobody can, nobody yeah. would believe her. Yeah. It's crazy. Wow. So basically that, that's the premise of the effect. I'm going to make a Cassandra uh, prediction because a lot of times you believe so much about something, but nobody does, but you, your heart of hearts do. So, you know, and just basically you go like, you're going to select this card, but if you, if I told you, if I put it back in the deck, there's a possibility, so we can destroy it. And blah, 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 blah. In the end, they select that card, even though it's destroyed and it's the only one in the deck and all that. It's, that's the Cassandrian prediction, basically. That's awesome. Yeah. I really love that uh, that premise. That's really cool, man. Because even just like the idea of having an open prediction, but it is something that... Or even not even necessarily like a prediction, but... In effect, yeah. that has the purity or like inevitability of if you were to, it's so mind blowing to the spectator that this inevitable thing is going to take place that it becomes a Cassandrian prediction because yeah. they're like, no, like he's he's joking, he's lying, it's not going to happen. But and that, then when it that, inevitably does, then but it's, that's that's the that's the that's why you push it because you go like you know you're going to select this card now if I put it back in the deck you're going to say, you know. Possibly, there's a possibility. So I'm not going to put it back in the deck. Check the deck if there's a duplicate, and they do. I go like, now, I'm st- this card still exists. Somehow I can sneak it back to the deck. So I'm going to destroy it and actually put it in the box. And put it in the box. Mm. And they're like, are we good now? Blah, blah, blah. Like, are you absolutely sure that it's no chance? So even though I still believe you can select this card, now it has become a Cassandra prediction because you, there's in your in your head there's no possible solution that this could yeah. happen. So go ahead and pick a card. And they do, but don't look at it. And they put it in front of them. You just take the box. You start shaking it. And they hear the pieces. Then suddenly go like, whoop. And they stop knocking. Wow. And then you open up the box. And there's nothing inside. Mm-hmm. And you go like, turn over the card. You select it. And it is the card you initially tore. Oh, that's awesome. And wow. To be fair, though, the premise of a Cassandra prediction was not mine. Mm-hmm. It was Guy Hollenworth's. He, I think oh, there really? is a wow. yes, there was his course, idea. He, guys, he, had, good. he has a different Cassandra effect. This is my interpretation of the premise. Mm. That's awesome. Wow, that's really cool. Lindsay said, What's your cat's name, Perseus? Which of the two? It's oh. Cece and Titika. I have two. This is Titika. Titika? Yes. Titika and Cece. That's cool. Yes. Titika is basically Cosette from. Uh, Les Miserables. From Le, Les Mis. Yeah, but it's Les a Miserables. Greek. It's called Titica, yeah. The cat is named Maximus. <laughs> <laughs> we Maximus. Drop, we? We Gluteus Maximus. Yeah. <laughs> Maximus, the gladiator. Amazing. This is Sparta. 
Uh, now, we did have some questions in the 20 questions we did not hit. So I think that it would be fitting for us to uh, to wrap those up before we wrap up this interview. So let's get to know oh, a little bit more about you. So um, favorite magician you said was who? I didn't. You it didn't. was uh, right around the time that the bell rang. Yeah, who's your favorite magician? It's, it's how, how could anyone possibly can answer that. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to performance, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to close up, to well, it, now that we don't have a time limit, if you have a particular criteria and a favorite underneath that umbrella, who would you say? Eric Mead is definitely one of my favorites. Mm. Hung out with, with Eric Mead a lot recently at Magic Live. And before that, Eric is a really great guy. Yeah. yeah. A great thinker in magic. Copperfield is always. I'm he kept sorry. he kept asking me to do magic for a few people, and then it kept like he kept bringing me more people over. He was like, "Can you do that one trick?" And just kept bringing more people. And I was just like, "Okay, one more, Eric. All right." And then I was just like pretty dead by the end of the night. It was a few hours of that. What were he, you saying? He, he loves seeing good magic. He's great. Oh he yeah, he's very supportive. Yeah, he's great. Uh, I I said also Copperfield is always you know oh, yeah. one of the most complete ones. I mean. Maybe not so much in close-up magic, but he has done some really good ones. Mm. Um, Kim Silverman. I really like Kim Silverman. Who is a favorite uh, when it comes to close-up? Probably Eric Mead or... Uh... My, my two Mead. questions would be close-up and then who inspires you as a storyteller? Ah, uh, so I mean, so hard, so hard questions because I gain my inspiration from everybody. Everybody can inspire me, mm. from known to unknown magicians, you know, to authors, to actors, to painters, to sculptors. I mean, when it comes to magic, and unfortunately, there's not many. <laughs> there are not many uh, that do narrates narrate then do script mm. magic yeah so it's like a lot of it's like cool technique cool atmosphere mm. yeah but you're pulling you it. kind of you kind of pull inspiration from outside of magic when it comes to that when it comes yeah, to narration mostly. mostly is that like movies or theater or where does that come from all of it movies theater books uh yeah. painting poetry mm. you name it i mean as long as it's some sort of expression narrative expression i'm, mm. I'm game now you have a pretty diverse background of skills because you, I mean, you were able to work and do marketing and things when it came to illusionist. Uh, and now when you have your own company, you are doing graphic design and product design, research yeah. and development, copy, like everything. Um, so what was your skill set background prior to this? Like, did you go to school for graphic design for business? That was my study. I, I my, I mean, my my study in university was basically sketch comics and cartoon. Mm, oh, that makes so much sense. That's what I studied before uh, I even before, magic yeah. bit me. Okay, because that makes so much sense that because you have a lot of talent when it comes to just design and drawing and graphics and everything as well. And your products are so clean with the packaging and things. And I'm like, how does this guy do everything himself? But it, it makes sense if it's your background. Yeah, it is, it's part of my background. Yeah. So then product design kind of naturally fell into that. It, it's like it's not product design. It's like, you know, I the, I have this skill set. I know how to, to paint and draw and like, why not use them? Why not make it part of the identity? Uh, the brand identity, you know, that yeah. each and every one of the products will have some sort of handmade design and all that, you know, I can illustrate. So why not put uh, illustrated booklets in each product? You know, a lot of people yeah. like to read or, you know, you buy something, you leave it on the shelf, you pick it up six months later and you go like, oh, I have to log in again to watch the video. No, yeah. just flip through the booklet. Oh, that's how it works. Yeah. And just go out and perform it. You know, why not? Which is an extra mile that most people wouldn't go to, though, because most other companies nobody aren't goes. Doing that. Nobody goes to that. Nobody goes. And that's awesome I know. When you do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But that's like something having the customer in mind because you've been a customer yeah. for so long, and then being able to know what is the gap in the market is awesome. That's, it's setting you apart that, so that quickly. Was exactly my brand new company. My 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 approach to begin with, you know, like I've been a customer, 
I've been an artist that released stuff with other companies and I've worked with the company for a year. So, I mean, I have numerous points of views when it comes to the magic market. So I, I know, I, I like to believe that I, I put out good magic for the magicians. Mm -hmm. I, when it's from another artist, I know how this artist feels and how he wants to be treated because it's his baby yeah. and all that. And when it comes to the company, I just wing it. I have my yeah. improvise. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but I mean, but you're doing a great job and everything is so Thank you. well done. So that's awesome to see. Um, we have the next question. If you won the lottery, what's the first thing you'd buy? Uh, look three music man guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great one. Um, what is your most highly recommended magic product or book? Of mine? Or in general, or yours, yeah. You, you can't leave it that vague. Are you, because okay, let's I, go, let's like go in both, general, um, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to propose mine. Of, of yours. I, I think I said mine when I was asked. Oh, what would you say for your own? Mosaic. Mosaic, the book? Yes. I and Tiles, which is the the sequel that i'm writing as we speak oh wow that's awesome all right um what about just uh, not your own but thing that you know that you'd recommend that's out there that people can get magic product or book when it comes to books strong magic design and miracles mm. by darwin ortiz tangled web by rick mead books of wonder I mean, these alone are real. Uh, and Our Magic by Masculine. Oh, and Our Magic by Masculine and Devon. I love that one so much. Absolutely. That's great. Absolutely. That's a really great standard for anybody to read. Um, such great recommendations. Wow. Um, if, you could re if you could remake any movie and star in it, what would it be? Fahrenheit 451. Oh, yeah. And that's a great book, too. And My, my favorite book. The, yeah. And I do yeah. have a piece of magic about it. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> best magic book I ever. I am a klutz book of magic. I like the encyclopedia of immaturity by klutz. Really great book. Um, uh, would you rather feel like a potato or look like a potato? Look, look like a potato. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think that's a good, good move feel still feel energized what's your what was your favorite toy growing up dinosaurs dinosaurs makes sense with the jurassic release coming up soon i mean yeah but, I, mean, I love dinosaurs always love dinosaurs that had it taste like a baked potato um and uh what's your favorite sports team I have no idea when it comes to sports. This is our favorite question of the show because everybody says that. Very few of our I, guests ever have an answer for favorite sports team. I it's suck. amazing, the Magic community. Nobody watches sports. And now I've got a new question. This is one that has not been asked on the show yet that I was excited. I added to the document the other day when I heard it. Um, what is the coolest story behind something you own? Favorite sports team, Spice. Girl. And I, I'm also going to tell you a question that you can ask from now on that you're going to love. Uh, the coolest story for an item I own? Yeah. Wow. That's that's a hard question. It's a hard question. I have many items. that Do they have cool stories now? I don't know. Uh -huh. I cannot answer the question. It's too hard. Okay. My charming Chinese challenge coins. Your what coins? My charming Chinese challenge coins. Charming Chinese challenge coins. What's the story behind that? So I was invited to China to lecture at some point. Mm. And I always loved Troy Hooser's charming Chinese challenge routine which uses the Chinese coins that all magic shops sell. And while I was in China, I was like, I'm here. <laughs> I might as well get actual Chinese coins. And so this guy that was uh, like my guide there, like my translator and all that, 
I told me, no, I need Chinese coins. I want to perform with old Chinese coins, the actual Chinese Chinese regime. It would be awesome all that. And he was also a magician. He goes away and comes back with <laughs> those big, tiny coins like, like this. Tiny and I'm like, tiny. yeah. Um, I I I thought they were bigger. And he goes like, well, we have those, but they're not actual. You know, they are Chinese, but they're not. I was like, yeah, give me the big ones. So probably I'm using, uh, which are not bad. I mean, look at those. Mm. Oh, nice. I don't know if they're Chinese. I have no idea. I bought. I I got them in China. Could be anything. But that's cool. No. But yeah, but it's a cool story. It's not that cool story. I mean, it's. I mean, it's. I got a cooler story for you. I, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna. I got a cooler story. You got a cooler story. All right. Yes. Do you know uh, Roberto Giobi's lucky coin routine? Roberto Giobi's lucky coin routine. I think I might have seen it, but I. I, I can't recall what happened. Amazing routine. routine. It's from Card College. Okay. Uh, and basically, you use a coin with a mini card on the back, and you do all. Oh, like, like with a poker chip with the card on the back, or something too, or that, a coin exactly with the card on the back, and then it, you have the spread, and you can place, and then yes, you... originally okay. I know, with I know, coin, right? John Armstrong has a great version of that as well. Yeah, a lot of people have taken it, uh, but it was I think it was first published actually in Card College. I'm not sure, but that's where I learned it, right? So and it was published with a with a coin. I also you know go out and you know start doing it with the chip and all that so at some point i heard that roberto jovi would be in at the session and i was going to be there so i was like you know what i've been making my living with that beautiful routine i think it would be a really nice homage to take the poker chip to roberto have him you know sign it like jovi across the face and whatever i perform from now on it will just say this on top of the of the on the on the poker chip you know as a as a nice you know homage you know from to the guy and i went to the session i met mr roberto jovi and i mm. told him the story of giving the poker chip and like yeah. would you mind signing it for me and he goes like yes of course and he signed on the edge with the most hideous handwriting you ever seen. <laughs> so that thing that i had in mind that would just say jovi you know, it would be look like actual a name of a casino. Or I could keep using that. But it's beautiful. It's just, just crumbled. Ruined. It just looked like horrible. And like horrible. Right. I could not perform with that anymore. So I was like, I'm gonna buy a new poker chip for my performance now. This could go into the shelf. Yeah, that didn't work. So that Ooh, I have uh, a signed so poker chip by Rebecca Joby, which I could not use as a performance. I think that's a better story. Dude, that's a good story no that's funny i i like that yeah um okay so this is a good new question to add into the mix is a cool story so the, uh, i want to propose a question as well yes i don't remember who asked me that at some point but it's like i thought i i, I think it was it's like a question that every interviewer should do at some point what and I, i'm gonna ask you yeah what do you think is the first lie you told yourself? Oh, that's an interesting question. Isn't it? That the first lie that I told somebody else wasn't so bad. You know, I think that there's when you lie to somebody else and you discover lying and then you're aware of that it's not a good thing. And then when you lie to somebody, but you justify it to yourself that it was okay in that moment, that's when you've lied to yourself for the first time. Yeah, but that, so, okay, that, that, that's the, the first thing you think you told yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that like the first time I think the first time that you justify a lie to some because like, okay, here's what I mean in like a in like an overall moralistic sense. If we go into this with the assumption that 
all lies are like bad or immoral and that you could go about operating life entirely honest all the time, Mm -hmm. then the first lie you told yourself was the first time you justified a lie. And you're like, it, I was supposed to not tell the truth there, you know, could be, I mean, could be, I I don't know. I mean, I I love that as an answer. I mean, I don't think that if that applies to everyone, maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't. Yeah. We'd like to, to so, but, I like that answer. I think it's a really interesting question. Hmm. Pose people. Yeah. Hmm, that is a cool question. I like that. I like these deep kind of philosophical metacognitizing questions. Do you have other ones? Uh, yes. No, one more. One more. One more. Which is really important because all interviewers say, how do you stop the magic? And they never ask why you're still doing it, which is, I think, more important. Mm. Why are you still doing magic? Why are you still... Okay, so the question is, why are you still doing magic? Yeah. I mean, you, you Not started. why you got started, but... No, because everybody gets started from for the wrong reasons, you know? <laughs> I mean, you... Most of, most of the people start magic, you know, for social anxiety, for the opposite sex, for attention, for... You know, these are... You know, but really, because they saw a magic trick and they wanted to learn how it's done or they saw it. And then they learn how they, they learn how it's done. Then they perform it to someone and they, they like the reaction. There's numerous reasons why someone starts magic. The thing is why after 20 or so years, they keep doing it. Mm. And if the reasons are the same, then that means there's no evolution in the meantime. So hopefully it's, the first answer it, is different than the second. It's Sisyphus. We're back to Sisyphus that comes to mind because the more my answer, at least that comes to mind, why are you still doing it? There's many reasons, obviously. But the first thing that came to mind as the answer was because the more that I learn and practice, the more that I discover about my potential, which makes me more dissatisfied about my current state of my own level where I'm at. So I need to move forward. So then I, so then I, so then I learn and I practice more so that I can get better because I know I'm capable of more, which allows me to discover that I'm capable of more, which makes me less satisfied with what I'm currently doing. So I need to keep moving forward and I roll the boulder another day. So that's why I'm still doing magic. Yeah. Because I, every day I know I see what I'm capable of and it keeps getting farther out, but that's cool because I'm excited that the destination is in sight but the goalpost keeps moving so i gotta keep rolling the boulder that's good that's the that's the 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 philosophical answer that comes to mind for why are you still doing it which is interesting because it's it's a personal answer because you could totally answer that from a from an external perspective of like because every opportunity to perform is a gift and because i get to share magic with people and get to make them smile and that's a power in and of itself that's so incredible so like i'm going to keep chasing that so like there is the external perspective but the first answer that came to mind was like it was like (laughs) sisyphus that's one thing that's so amazing about greek mythology is because that so much can be related back to it because there's so much intrinsic wisdom in these stories like huh wow wow i uh i'm noticing uh, there, there's some kind of controversy going on in the chat right now about, um, about bullies. And I don't know exactly what they're talking about. And I think that people are inquiring to figure out who this person's talking about when it comes to bullies, um, and magic live. Um, I know that at least when it comes to this podcast, all Ryan and myself did at magic live was interview a bunch of our friends and do silly, ridiculous trolling style interviews with just a few of our friends. Uh, And we certainly don't condone bullying and want to uplift everybody in the magic community. Uh, And we hope everybody had a great time. And uh, if any, and the only time that I think we've done anything remotely bullying ish on this podcast is maybe sometimes we will react to magic videos and sometimes we won't be big fans of them. So if that, if you're in the chat and you're talking about bullying, if we have reacted to you or a friend of yours and you didn't like our reaction, please let us know and we'll 
talk to you about it and maybe apologize or whatever or talk about it. But I think maybe you're not even talking about us. But I just wanted to see what was going on in this chat about bullies. I don't think that they're even necessarily talking about us. But I think just know that Ryan and I don't condone bullying in the magic community. We want to bring everybody up and support them. Like our friend Perseus over here, who is always supportive of everybody. I know some people like I remember this. I remember I was talking to some guy on Discord and he was like, Oh yeah, I was just chatting with Perseus the other day, and he made me a logo out of nowhere. <laughs> just... Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you if you, have, if you can, why not? Yeah, just being a friendly like, and this is somebody that you just knew only over Discord, right? Like, just to, yeah. yeah, just being a supportive friend. So, why yeah, not? I think that's the thing is we just bring up other people in the community, but that uh, that's awesome. I uh, I think it's really cool that you've shared so much incredible magic with us. Is there any other trick that you wanted to do? Anything that you had on deck that you wanted to share? Or no, 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 pretty good. Mind. I mean, uh, shut up. Just came to mind because we're talking about it. No, yeah, yeah, that was great, and that you were Ill- able to illustrate your point <laughs> with uh, with the magic, which is exactly what we were talking about using magic to illustrate your uh, <laughs> your narrative. So that's been a blast. So what is uh, on the uh, the horizon right now? Just uh, focusing on Orion or focusing on shows? What's the uh... both? Both. I mean, I cannot step out away from shows. I need to perform. I need it for me. And you know, <laughs> so it's like you know, private shows, uh, corporate events. Uh, I will start table hopping as well at one or two bars if I have the time. But and the company, of course, and you know, new releases, new magic. I I am really trying to you know put out good magic. I'm really trying mm. to put out practical and magic that people will do yeah one way or the yeah, other yeah. I mean, yeah. and the fact that i'm performing this with a metaphor or the symbolic that doesn't mean you should perform it like you could just take medusa and mm. perform it like an omni deck which, which to me would be even it would be much better than the omni deck because you know, did i did i tell you my impromptu presentation for medusa which is rock no. paper scissors did I tell you about that? Has no. anybody said this to you before about rock, paper, scissors? No. Oh my gosh. But just the idea of putting the deck in someone's hand already and they have it and they're holding onto it in their hand after you've done a routine. And so then you're like, you know what? Let's rock, paper, scissors over it. And then just going like rock, paper, scissors. And no matter what they choose, it always leads into it. Because let's say that they play scissors and you play rock, right? And I was thinking of a few different options where what if you don't even show your hand? You're like, let's play rock, paper, scissors, right? So they've got the the deck already in their hand that's already turned to stone um, or the Sharpie or whatever. Uh, this Oh, <laughs> Mark's saying this was a secret. Yeah, because we came up with it as we were talking in Discord. I was <laughs> back chatting with him and I came up with this idea. Um, but then I was like, what if you do rock, paper, scissors and then you just drop your hand? right so i go let's play rock paper scissors we go rock paper scissors shoot and i just drop my hand and you play whatever you played so if you played scissors right then i would go oh i win and you go what are you talking about you didn't even play anything and i'm like no i I chose rock 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 beats scissors right and i'm like check inside your hand and then they look and then the deck turned into a rock right then second option is they play paper and you're like all right and you're like here Oh, put it over your other hand. Oh, you won. You know what paper covers? Paper covers rock. And then they open up and then now it's a rock in their hand that they've been covering with their paper. Or they choose rock and then it's like, okay, well, you chose show, rock and then it turns into a rock. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. just instead of stone. It I was would just say the if, if they go paper, you go, you go like, oh, we got all three. And you go like, what do you mean? Yeah, oh, I yeah. You, go, you, got all three, paper, I got scissors, paper. you yeah, got... you got rock. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that. but then it just like a simple like it's not even an equivoke or equivocate whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. just it just is whatever option. But I just thought it would be so fun because when Ethan was saying, "Oh, he wanted a casual thing he could present," I was just like, "Do rock paper scissors." It would be so fun, and then it just turns into a rock. And I kind of want to try it and see what happens. I think that obviously the Medusa presentation is much stronger when you're trying to really bring people in. But I was like, imagine maybe you wouldn't want to do the Medusa in a club environment and at risk breaking the, <laughs> the thing, like them dropping it. But like yeah, nobody drops it. Nobody drops it. Okay. Yeah. So then, then we would be totally fine. But imagine if you're like in a club and they can't really hear you well. And then, so there's no time, but you do a card routine and then you're just like rock, paper, yeah. scissors. And then it turns into a rock in their hand. They would scream. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially when you cannot speak uh, and create an atmosphere and bring them in. Mm-hmm. All that. You're just going to go, oh, all right, yeah. you're just going to, 
do the trick. <laughs> you're just going to do roller coaster magic. All right. They just roll. Exactly. Speed. Like if you're in an environment where they can't hear you very well, then like just doing something really fast, like not much talking would be crazy. Um, one question, I, one last question I had just, uh, how has it been the transition for working from a magic company to now owning your own magic company and the new roles that you've had to take on? What has that transition been like and, uh, and how are you enjoying it or the struggles is- that you've had along the way? it is a, it is exactly like from going from you know like a hobbyist to full-time pro mm. it's a leap of faith you yeah. like you, you believe in it and you just jump and mm. we'll see because it's still f- so fresh it's like five months and you know mm. all the reviews are five star reviews everybody talks good about the products the packaging everything so it seems to be going well. I mean, I hope mm. it will continue being like that. Yeah, it is taxing because it's like a lot. It, everything goes through my hands, which leaves little to no time for anything else. Mm. And again, a lot of times I'm on Discord, as I said, I'm on Discord all the time, and I'm just, you know, casting Medusas or doing stuff about the company while talking with the guys. I'm like, that's what it is, and it's mm. like, yeah. But it, yeah, you're very good at that. You're much better than me at multitasking and being able to chill in Discord <laughs> and chat with people and also be getting a ton of other stuff done. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, you, you have to. You cannot just... Yeah. I, I'm not good at going like, okay, I'm going to block everything just to work. I prefer working with good friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's awesome, man. That's Excellent. What if they enough. chose Steam Shovel? What if they chose Steam Shovel? Emotional damage. What? <laughs> Uh, but this has been uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for jumping on. I know. So basically, for anybody that's in the comments, I just jumped on the Discord and I said, Perseus, are you cool hanging out for anywhere between thirty and thirty thousand seconds? <laughs> and then, exactly. And then you said, Literally. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and I don't know if we're past 30,000 seconds, but this has been a blast. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, I just really thank appreciate you. Fun, man. I, I really pleasure. feel like it's been very insightful and, uh, and funny. So thanks again, man. Hope so like everybody, if you are interested in checking out Perseus's work, you can check him out on Instagram. It's at Perseus Arcomanis, right? On Instagram or no, it's, still, uh, it's still, yeah, it's, that's mine, but it's like yeah, yours at or there's Orion, at Orion magic production. Magic production yeah. So I'll uh, I'll throw up the uh, the website as well, orionmagicproductions.com. You can check out the site, check out all of his releases, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash allaccessmagic, and we will see you again real soon next week, and hopefully Ryan will be back. Thanks so much again, Perseus. Thanks Peace. so much for having me again. Take care.